Welcome back to Tech Talks. I'm your host, Jack Brandwood, and this is a podcast where I speak to some of the brightest and most influential people in the tech industry in the UK. This week, I sit down with the head of engineering at Tez, Ryan Temple. Our conversation ranges from the struggles when integrating businesses through acquisitions, utilizing tech for the education sector, and how we can pass the ladder down for the next generation of techies coming through. With acquisitions, it's it's kind of the, the technology of the founders, and you know, it's the right way to do it, right? And if you're gonna start a startup, you need to work with what you know best and not necessarily what's fashionable at the time. For more information on this episode and Tact Talks, head over to tact it.co.uk. Thanks so much for listening and enjoy the episode. Hi, Ryan. Thanks for coming on. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for uh, inviting me. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I always like to start these things off with a very philosophical question. Who is Ryan Temple? God, that is a, it's a very deep question. Uh, I think, you know, talking just before we start this, I'm a, a Yorkshire lad, I suppose, first and foremost, um, and a computer programmer and uh, dad to two two sons, so yeah, that's what I describe myself as. Nice, fantastic, and because you're currently the head of engineering at Tez, that's right, yeah. obviously, and we'll go into what Tez do and that sort of thing in a minute. Um, as I kind of, I say, pre warned you, told you before we started the podcast, we we're going to be doing this big vision of ours at Tax is trying to build a place where everyone gets their dream job. Your career started somewhere, obviously. Could you do us a favor? Could you draw? exactly what it was that you wanted to be when you grew up when i grew up or when i started in it or or i think when you when you were when you were a little bambino what were you thinking about you wanted to be <laughs> and as i said don't worry if you're a bad drawer because i mean i am a terrible drawer so <laughs> i will uh, that's a questionable drawing stick men all around <laughs> i mean i am fairly kind of uh sport obsessed i would describe so amazing uh, my dream job, I'd say, would be uh, in football somewhere. Now, there we go. That was my first. So. And I always played, always played in the net when I was younger because I was never that good outfield. So we'll, we'll draw that as a little thing there. That's brilliant. Yeah, and this is um, this is a really good thing actually because. Um, Amazing! Thank that. you very much. I think you can see why we're we'll, we'll getting into that. Why? Uh... So goalkeeper. Yes, goalkeeper. Awesome. But, Thank you. But that that also explains really well why why I do sort of computer programming. I think because uh, I, I quite like making things, but as you can see from that, I'm pretty <laughs> pretty terrible at drawing and pretty terrible at like creating things with my hands. So sure. It's, it's kind of like a another way around it, I suppose. Of course. So so I guess kind of starting from uh, Charlie, you say you're a Yorkshire lad, grew up in Yorkshire. What what were you like as a kid? So it was like, uh, I don't know, kind of um, sport obsessed. So I uh, always, always loved sort of watching, playing sport a bit. I kind of at school always like problem solving and, and figuring things out. So like maths, I, I always thought actually when I was younger that I, I'd go into a job doing something with maths. But um, like, I, I don't know. I don't, don't know what you draw for that, right? And then, you know, when I was growing <laughs> up, I never sitting at a desk somewhere doing maths of some kind. But um, I always just like, Solving solving problems. Um, and the other thing for, from being young is is um, like family is really important to me. So I've got quite a big family, and where I'm from in Rotherham, all my family we lived in about a, a square mile, so we're really really close to each other. So um, that'd be what I remember. Like lots of time with family and, and that kind of stuff. And what do you uh, do? You have siblings? Uh, I've got one sister. Yeah. One's that? And what does she do? Uh, so she's a teacher now. Ah, oh, okay. Well, that kind of. <laughs> Yeah, so we've kind of sort of worked his way. So she did a lot of like sports coaching and stuff and, and worked her way towards teaching. And I've ended up coming via computer programming to the, the, the same kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, very, uh, it's very uh, w w weird the way the world works. And how did you get into computer programming? What was the journey? We had a, we had a computer at home. My, my dad was kind of always one of those that, and he still is, like if, if there's a new bit of technology, he's, he's always kind of like one of those early adopters. So we, we had a computer at home when it was, you know, dial up internet and, um, I guess I used to mess around with that. I didn't really do a lot of programming um, up until college, really, because I suppose when the, the, there wasn't the things that there was now, you know, I've done things with kids, sort of seven and eight, teaching them the basics of programming, and there's you know, loads of really good stuff now. But um, it was when I got to college, actually, I was picking my A-levels, and, and they sort of said, oh, well, we think you should choose an, an extra A-level. Um, 
and that was computing that I chose as that sort of extra one. So it was kind of, it wasn't really my intention either. I just sort of picked it as, oh, this, this sounds interesting. And then uh, when I started doing it there, I got really into it. And then obviously went on to, to university from there. Oh, so the tr kind of a traditional route, really. But, yeah. But very easily, you could have not. Yeah, de definitely. Like, I, you know, I was sat or, or stood that day kind of in college and I, we were making my choice between computing or I think it was like economics or something. I could have quite easily um, not chosen it. But um, as soon as I started with it, like I was just saying, it's that kind of um, that feeling of I can actually make something like, look, you know, you can point to this and say, look, I've done that. I've made this thing. And it's something I, I really enjoyed. So I kind of followed it through from there. Love that. Okay. And, and then how did you, so you left university and then, then what was the journey to, I guess, to now where you are at TES? Straight out of university doing software engineering jobs, um, like web development, like fairly small stuff. Um, and that was all right. Did that for kind of a few years. And then um, I started to, 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 to want like a little bit more impact or to, to feel like I was making, making a bit of a difference. I think it's, it's you know, we, from my career, I've always sort of gone places where um, what they're doing is quite important to me or, or what the thing is that they're working on. I was lucky enough to get a job at the BBC as uh, working on bite size. So that was kind of the start of the educational stuff. Um, but, you know, obviously going straight into somewhere like the BBC, then straight away you've got like a huge audience, a huge, you know, impact and reach with what you're doing. So um, so I worked at the BBC for a few years, all, all on bite size, stayed on bite size. Um, really interesting times like the start of the pandemic when we did all of the daily lessons stuff and um you know kind of really quickly turned all that around while we were, you know the world was changing everyone was working from the bedrooms and stuff that was like a really nice thing to be involved in um and then after that i moved to well pharmacy i was the head of engineering there so obviously they're doing uh like online pharmacy delivery and medication and all that kind of stuff uh, and then most recently i've been at tez um as a head of engineering, so I'm actually one of one of three heads of engineering split across all of our products, um, and we do sort of a wide range of stuff, really. So uh, basically, all software aimed at teachers, students, um, school administrators, all that kind of stuff. That the area that I work on is mainly around the kind of day to day of the classroom, is is how I describe it. Sort of like the, the actual running of the the classroom, the timetables, parents' evenings. Um, attendance and stuff during the day that kind of thing brilliant and i'm, I'm really looking forward to getting to that i mean just before we do get there what is the story of tez because i know it's got, it's got a great story yeah so tez was times educational supplement so as, as the name suggests started out as a um a supplement in the times newspaper so i think that started around 1910 1911 um, i really should double check my dates because i don't know. 1910 i, I checked yeah. before yeah <laughs> so we're good there um, and obviously continued as, as a, a magazine, a print magazine for teachers. Um, that the, the print magazine went right up until December of last year. So just before I joined, actually, I joined just as they released their final ever um, print magazine and they moved it then digital only. Um, so online subscription based. Um, but in more recent years, um, Tez obviously separated from the Times and became a, a standalone company. And I guess it, we've, this sort of change direction really moving from being a, a media company to a software company and, and actually have started building up um, a range of software products for teachers. I think um, probably most well known for the uh, teaching job boards so, uh, where schools advertise for new teachers, teachers go and apply. Um, we also have things like the, uh, the resources sections as well where teachers can share uh, worksheets and things like that with each other uh, to help with lesson planning so a teacher can go on find worksheets and you know, do that sort of stuff. So that's how we kind of got started, I think, in software. And then we've been growing quite rapidly over the last few years. We've been acquiring uh, other companies that do similar things. So, you know, we'll talk about some of the, the products that I work with. They're actually all companies that were previous acquisitions. Um, so they were, you know, separate to Tez before. Um, and now we're very much in that kind of um, software SaaS kind of world where we're trying to build a... Um, you know, that sort of platform for teachers, for schools to, to get everything they need. So, so what's it like working for a, a business that's over a hundred years old? I would say it doesn't feel like that because it's, it's, because it's changed, you know, so, so much, particularly over recent years, yeah. you've kind of got that history and, and that's, that's still really important, right? We've still got a, a really good editorial team that do the, the magazine and, um, 
you know, they're still doing things like uh, going out and speaking to um, the education secretary and, and kind of getting that real, you know, real good journalism stuff in there. But we've also got that, uh, you know, the new software stuff as well, where we're kind of able to help schools and, and teachers, and particularly like at the minute when money is tight for schools and stuff like we think we can generally genuinely kind of save time and help teachers sort of do more for, for their pupils it's, it's almost like you're a hundred year old startup yeah yeah kind of. <laughs> and, and obviously because you've got the you know we've got the acquisitions you've got almost bits of the products or bits of the company are at different points right like you yeah. know when we're bringing people in they're kind of they would have been startups themselves that kind of thing you mentioned there that your primary kind of focus is to help what your what your approach you're working on is to help teachers um, in the classroom, basically. So, what what are some of the products that you you are working on right now? I guess one of the main products is uh, something called class charts, which is we're looking at things like behaviour of the students and um, optimising seating plans. So, you know, if you have two students sat next together and you you know that, uh, or you can see from the system that usually they they'll have behavioural problems when they're sat together, then we can suggest like an optimal seating plan that'll hopefully improve the behaviour of the the classroom and that obviously then means that the teacher can get more done other products that we've got in the same range so um provision maps is is another uh, product built by the same team and a provision map is a so that's a an educational term basically for a student that might need additional support for whatever reason uh, a provision map is basically the plan that, that a teacher has to come up with in order to, to sort of say this is you know this is what the students needs are this is how we're supporting them now that's really useful for a a teacher because they can they can track that it's the kind of thing that they need to show Ofsted when they come in and do inspections and say this is the plan that we've got in place um, and also it, it, there's opportunities for them to then unlock funding as well if they can say well look these are the things that we're doing they can sort of demonstrate that um, they qualify for certain funding and that kind of thing and then other things so we've got uh, I've got a team based out actually in, in Australia that do uh, timetabling software so creating just the you know your, your timetable for your students which is it's actually a really, really interesting technical problem to try and cater for all the different things that a school might want in a timetable. You know, you like all the different students, all the different lesson types, teachers and buildings and everything like that. Uh, in my area, at least the most recent acquisition is products that first focus on parents' evenings. So that's doing um, in-person, but also online parents' evening. And obviously that's been pretty big over the last few years, like d during the pandemic, letting parents book slots with teachers, letting them join video calls and doing it all kind of online um which the parents like because it's more convenient the teachers like because it it kind of lets them enforce that schedule and stay on time because everyone gets like a fixed slot and then when you're done you're done kind of thing yeah. so yeah it's all around that kind of day-to-day -day management of the school from uh, taking the register in the morning to the you know the timetable where they go into um sharing the the behavior and, and stuff like that with, with the parents at parents evenings wow that's incredible and has it been a long time coming i mean have, has, and again from someone who's not in the industry, has the educational industry in the UK been quite behind when it comes to tech or, or not? I, there's, there's a lot of companies sort of working working in the space at the minute because I think there's a lot of opportunity there. And so some of our products there, are, um, like Class Tracks, for example, has grown up over seven, eight years. So it's, it's been going for, for quite a while. Yeah, so I, I'd say there's, there's quite a bit there, but I think it's something that schools are probably looking to increasingly a, a bit more to try and um you know find ways to support their teachers and find ways to kind of help you know uh, as i said when when money's perhaps tight for schools or whatever if they can do something to to reduce the burden on teachers then then obviously that's a, a good thing yeah of course and it, it, it's a very easy company to get behind tes then in that yeah. way right um yeah it, it's like it, like i said with everything that i've done i've always tried to um for me personally, I, I really need that kind of, um, what's the purpose of this, right? What's the, the reason that we're doing what we're doing? And like I said, for Tez, it's, it's pretty easy, right? You know, the stuff that we do is directly helping teachers every day, directly helping pupils as well. Um, and that's, you know, it's, it's a good thing for us all to kind of be working towards. Absolutely. You mentioned there that Tez has grown quite rapidly and uh, mainly through acquisitions. How has that been from an engineering perspective, all these businesses being acquired and how have you dealt with that? So obviously you, you acquire businesses and you, you, you tend to get different tech stacks, right? You know, if you grow your company internally, you'll have a, um, we do JavaScript for everything or, or whatever. Um, whereas with acquisitions, it's it's kind of the, the technology of the founders and, you know, it's the right way to do it, right? And if you're going to start a startup, you need to work with 
what you know best and not, not necessarily what's kind of fashionable at the time. So we've got really, really talented teams. So some really great engineers that, that come along with those products and support and, and help build them. Um, and I think it's, it's about finding that balance of, well, we, we're bringing you into Tez so that there's opportunities, right? We can start, um, you know, maybe using some things that are shared, using some things that are common and taking away some of the burden to, to kind of um, free up the teams to work on the interesting bits, you know, the kind of unique thing at the end of the day, like we don't, you don't buy a company because of their email service or their, um, you know, notifications or anything like that. That's just something that they need to do. We buy the, the, the products that we've got is because they're doing something interesting. They're doing something like class charts that's, that's quite unique. So it's, I think it's trying to find that balance between, you know, obviously the, there's always a move to consolidate and you shared stuff when you, you've got a company, but you, you want to do that in a way that doesn't, slow down the team from what they're building doesn't impact them it's, it's you know trying to free them up if anything trying to um, make things easier for them i assume there's going to be more acquisitions and um in the future uh, what what's going on behind the scenes in the engineering department right now what's is there anything that you can tell us that we need to keep an eye out for or a lot of what we're looking at is that kind of consolidation right like do you um can we move towards those sort of shared services um can we start getting the idea of like a you know you, you've got all these products that are perhaps separate okay how do you start linking things together how do you start creating that platform that single place that schools come to and we're we're in a well, we feel that we're in a good position to do that because of the sort of range of services that we can provide through the products that we've built ourselves but also through the the acquisitions that we've made and i think again what what tez are doing is so so important and I read something earlier and it was about, it was from, I think it was the 2020, 2021 Teacher Wellbeing Index. Um, it looked pretty professional, so I'm going to, I'm going to assume it's um, legit. They said like uh, teachers mental health at the minute is lower than it's ever been. Um, even like when the height of COVID was happening. Why, why, why do you think that is? I'm not really sure to be honest. I mean, I, there's obviously a lot of pressure on, um, a lot of pressure in a lot of places these days and, of and i think teaching is is no different right um this is purely anecdotal but i know know a few teachers that um have left the profession recently kind of off the back of covid perhaps sort of reevaluating things and whether that's caused pressure i, I, I don't know but it's it's um yeah a challenging environment i think for them really tough job and i think again just a stat like that you look at that and you think and then you look at what tez are doing I think it's again it's, it's even easier to get behind you're you're making hopefully uh teachers jobs easier and more yeah. efficient right yeah definitely and, and some of the other like not necessarily my area so not something that i've got an in-depth knowledge of but you know we have products that are let schools keep an eye on things like that right so they check in with the teachers how they're doing and how they're feeling about um things and then that hopefully then um if the schools have got that information right if we can say you know, your teachers are struggling at the minute or they're, they're having problems and they can take actions to kind of uh, improve things for them as well. So hopefully we can kind of help the teachers in that way. That's fantastic. We spoke with you the day before you came on the podcast and you mentioned something, you mentioned a term that I've, I've been uh, using myself and I haven't been quoting you, I'm sorry, but um, I have to pretend it's mine, um, about passing the ladder down mm. uh, in the industry. Obviously everyone knows there's a massive shortage of tech talent right now. And um, yeah, you, you talked about yeah, passing the ladder down. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so obviously, like, you know, we covered at the start, I, I went a fairly traditional route, I suppose, into computer science. So I went to Sheffield Uni, I did a degree, and um, went and got a graduate job after that. Like, to me, it's, it's important for all of us, you know, all of us in, in technology, whatever jobs we do, to, to try and make sure that we're creating opportunities for other people to, to get into technology. And obviously, universities are uh, a lot more expensive that it now than it was when I went, which you know, probably shows my age a little bit, but like, I, I don't know now if if I was sort of 18 sitting and looking at it, whether I, the, the cost of it would put me off. I think it, it probably would. But, you know, the, the good news is there's, there's so many different ways now. Um, and also for your teams as well, it's, it's not just about kind of offering different ways and you want to bring different voices into the room, right? Like, we've all probably got a picture of like a very stereotypical engineering team and we want to have a more diverse set of opinions and a more diverse team um, because we'll build better products for it. Um, so, we, you know, we knew university is not, not available to everyone because of the cost, because of the time commitment, there's loads of different things. So, um, 
I did, did work at the BBC with sort of career returners, career change. So the BBC ran a scheme called Women in Tech, which was looking at getting uh, women who wanted to change careers. And, and I was part of that. At TES, um, I've been leading on the apprenticeship scheme that we've set up for software engineers. So uh, we've currently got three apprentice software engineers that are going through the training right now. They are a mix of, of external people who wanted to come in, who you know, didn't want to go to uni or whatever. And but also we had a couple of people from within the company who wanted to retrain. And that's really good because obviously if you've got someone in the company, they've got that specialist knowledge, they understand why the things are important. They're, they're already doing to that. If you can then add on that kind of technical skills, then you, you've got a really good engineer. We're hoping as well to, to do um, four more in the new year in February, uh, four more apprentices. Um, and to, to me, it's it's kind of one of the most important things that I do, right, is develop the careers of all my staff is, is probably my number one job, but creating those opportunities that, that wouldn't be there otherwise. And particularly for people that, people in groups that perhaps wouldn't get opportunities for a career in technology. I feel really lucky to have had the opportunities to do the things I have because of a career in tech, right? Like I've, you know, worked for the BBC and, and done some amazing stuff there. I've gotten to travel and go to conferences and, and all of that kind of stuff, which without technology, I, I you know, don't think that I would have been able to do. And so um, being able to offer that opportunity to other people is is really good. It's one of the things that really uh, motivates me in, in my role is, is being able to do that kind of stuff. Amazing. I think you mentioned there around opportunities and and that sort of thing. And it, and it kind of leads on to my next question, which is, can you, I mean, can you tell me about someone that you've crossed paths with that's had a massive impact on your career? Yeah, sure. So my engineering manager, when I joined the BBC, um, the guy called James, um, and he, he had a massive impact. So he, he, you know, kind of gave me the opportunity first and foremost, right? He, he sort of let me make that jump up to to lead a team there, but then also mentored and coached and, and sort of grew me along the way kind of thing. Um, and I think it was that kind of seeing someone in a position of leadership, but investing a lot of time in growing the people around them. And it's something that I very much kind of believe as well, but it's that sort of thing of almost for his staff, trying to promote them out of the job, promote them to the same level as him kind of thing. Yeah. So, you know, doing it in that kind of selfless way of actually we all benefit if we've got the best possible team. Um, and if the end result of that is someone is really successful and gets a promotion, then that's something that we should celebrate. That's, you know, that's a, a really good thing. Um, so he definitely had a, a massive impact on um, myself. So quite a few years there sort of learning and, and being coached by him and then had the opportunity to, to do some of the bite-sized stuff on my own and then obviously moved on from, from there. So. Big shout out to James. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for giving us Ryan. Okay, well, look, last question, because I'm conscious of time now, but uh, last question, I promise I'll, I'll let you go. If you knew, a quite dramatic question, if you knew your today was your last day on earth, and apart from spending time with family, I know you're a big family man, um, and being on this amazing podcast, obviously, what would you be doing? What would you be up to? Well, like I said, like my, my default for anything, like, you know, I get home at night and I'm terrible. I don't watch box sets or anything like that. I usually watch some form of sports. So I think it'd probably, probably be that. I'd go to a football match or ice hockey, something like that. Of, aside from the competitive element, it's just something I find really interesting in the kind of um, performance aspect of it. And, you know, there's there's lots of things out there, podcasts and stuff like that, where um, sports people talk about, like, performance in, in other aspects of, of their life. But, yeah. And then they get a drink, you know, go, go, go to the pub with friends, something like that. And um, I, I don't know, I'm quite a... Not a homebody, but, I mean, I'm quite comfortable being around people that I know and that, that sort of thing. So yeah, if, if I knew it was my last day, I think it'd be, be that kind of thing. Head, head back to Rotherham maybe and uh, see friends. There you go. Exotic. Rotherham is very exotic. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Especially this time of year. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> awesome. Well, look, thank you so much for coming on. Really interesting to hear about what Tez are doing. I think it's an incredibly important service that you're providing. So I'm sure it's going to be amazing and uh, excited to see where Tez are in the next six to 12 months. Brilliant. Thank you. And that's it for this week's episode. Thanks so much for listening. And I really hope you enjoyed it. Anything we talked about will be linked in the show notes. And if you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. And we'll catch you on the next one.